I'm going to share with you a story that I've never shared before. So <laughs> there's a little fear there. It's a very personal story. But I believe that I had to shed what I was planning because I was supposed to close with this story with you at this divine appointed day. I get asked a lot, how did you get to Arizona? Well, I was traveling all over the world. I was speaking in Scottsdale, Arizona, got sick, got sent to somebody, friend's doctor, who grounded me, said, cancel all your speaking engagements, cancel all your flights for the next three weeks, you're grounded. So I never left. I live in Scottsdale, Arizona. And it wasn't but a few days that I met this amazing man. His name is Ron Black. Now, Ron was a, uh, a music man. He loved it. He lit up. Every cell of his body lit up when he was playing music or he was teaching somebody else, adult or a child, how to play guitar. And Ron and I had wonderful times together. We played together. We rode bikes together. We just had a great time together. But I, I was a little guarded, you know. Um, you know, you've had those situations in life, uh, maybe that you've been hurt before, and, you know, you're just taking it slow. So, you know, Ron and I dated, and, and we always dreamed that we would go to Hawaii for a few weeks in the summer. So four years later, the decision's made. The opportunity's there. We're going to go to Hawaii. So we booked our ticket. We booked our condo. We booked our celebratory. Finally, our dream has come true. And we went on our 15-mile bike ride. On the way back from that bike ride, the doctor called. It was Saturday at 8 a.m. Never a good time. Ron had just had a physical, uh, he was in great shape, but the doctor said, your lab tests have come back and you're in a panic potassium level and you need to get to the emergency room immediately. And Ron said, I just got off my bike. He said, get to the emergency room immediately. As I rushed him into the ER, they confirmed the test and he wasn't at panic potassium level and we had four doctors come in and all say the same thing. You should be dead. You should be dead. You should be dead. You should be dead. And then he coded. But they got him back. And they did more tests, and they found out he had renal cancer. Stage four. No cure. So Ron had some choices to make, right? Dialysis, chemo, radiation, lots of choices. And he chose that, yes, he would choose dialysis because it would keep him alive and going. So 12 hours a week, as all you know, he was hooked up to the machine, but he was still working away on his computer. And then he would get off his bike and get off the machine and get right on his bike. Doctors couldn't explain how somebody on dialysis was doing this. And Ron and I decided two things. Number one, we were going to support each other through the whole journey. And number two, we we're going to bring as much joy to the situation as possible. So Ron had a great sense of humor. I mean, he was in and out of the hospital, fluid on the lungs, infections, and every time we pulled up to the emergency room, he would go, ah, oh, my alma mater. <laughs> had us all laughing. Fast forward, it's the next May. May is my busiest month. Nurses week, hospital week, healthcare conferences, I'm all over the place. And I had left Ron and he was doing fine. We took a 15 mile bike ride three days before. But it was a Wednesday morning at 7 a.m. that his dialysis nurse said, Ron isn't here. He's never late. She says, I've got to go track him down. And she went well above her job description. And sure, she's hard to call in his home and then his cell phone and then his daughter. And finally, she got me in Miami at a hotel and I was getting ready to go on and speak. And we got the police in and the police got him to Mayo Clinic and he was alive, although the cancer had hit the brain and he had a stroke and he had been on the floor, bathroom floor for two days. So I, I got brushed back to Scottsdale as quick as I could and met with the oncologist. And the ecologist showed me the brain scan, and it was like the final gunshot wound to the head. I knew then that I had to do the hardest thing that I would ever have to do, 
and that is sign the papers to cut off dialysis and let Ron die. But all of a sudden, some of Ron's friends started coming in, and, 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 they, and they said, Ron, you know, can we be there for your last dialysis treatment? May we, I see you. Can we bring our guitars and banjos? And I'm like, he said, I'm par paralyzed on my left side, but my right arm, I'm going to be hooked up to the machine, but I think I can still play an air guitar. And I'm like, all right. So another miracle. Just days ago, I found a 15-second clip of Ron's last dialysis treatment in Mayo ICU, and he's playing his air guitar. Can you run it, guys? There was more for them. <laughs> wow. Wow, yeah. Wow. Unbelievable. Who celebrates like that, your last dialysis treatment? So after they had their jamming session, he was transferred to a hospice facility. And when he got there, I said, Ron, do you have any requests? And he says, yes, I would like an interactive funeral. I said, what? I want to be alive at my funeral. Okay, whatever. And within 24 hours, we had a live funeral. There was standing room only at the community room at the hospice center. We had people on conference calls all over the world. We had people on Skype who were dialing in and sending cards and messages to be read at the funeral. Ron, they got him up in a wheelchair, and he had us laughing one minute and crying the next. He said, Kathy, I'm going to be traveling with you now speaking. I'll just be outside the plane. What? So when he took Ron back to his hospice room, I said, sweetheart, how are you doing this? How are you dying so well? I mean, I've got my graduate degree is in death and dying. Teach me. He said, you die well by living well today. Wow, wow. And then the phone rang, and it was the organ donation people. And we had already talked to him, and I said, listen, his whole body is ridden with cancer, but can't we just do an evaluation? And they said, we have. Ron can donate his skin. So I, I walk up to Ron, and I said, sweetheart, sweetheart, I know you're ready to go to bed, but they just called from the organ donation. You can donate your skin. And he said, I'm shedding my skin so that other people can live. Woo! <clears throat> you know, I went home that night to bed, and I think I realized for the first time how much this man loved me and how much I loved him to the depths of my soul. So I woke up the next morning, I looked in the mirror, and I said, you're getting married today. He's like, what? Get your parents' rings out of the, out of the jewelry box and, and get on your bike and pedal three blocks to the hospice. So I'm pedaling away and pedaling away, and all of a sudden I'm thinking, we've never talked about the M word. That means I'm going to have to ask him. My throat started getting a little dry and stomach started churning. And I'm like, what if he says no? I mean, what if a dying man tells you no? I mean, that'll be 10 more years of therapy. But I knocked on the door and I said, sweetheart, I have a question for you. Will you marry me? Yes. Yes. So then there was a knock on the door. It was the hospital's chaplain. He said, can I help you? And I said, well, matter of fact, do you marry people? He said, yeah, I got the book in my car. I'll be right back. And then he came back and he performed the ceremony. 
right by the bedside. And then he said, you know, will you tell Lizzie to go get that bottle of water from our first date five years ago? And I said, you kept a bottle of water from our first date? He said, yeah. And I said, well, I guess there are some things you shouldn't shed. Um, uh, he, wanted, he said, I want to toast our wedding. And so we toasted with the water. And I said, Ron, this has been an amazing five years. And he said, in the next five are going to be even more amazing. Wow. 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 So, you know, when the, when the, when the minister back at Mayo ICU got there, Reverend Mirage, they had been become big buddies. And he walked in the room back at Mayo ICU. And, and, and the first thing, he, he looks up um, to Reverend Mirage and he says, Reverend Mirage, I've got some bad news for you. Your guitar lesson is canceled this week. And then he said, does Jesus have a band? Because I want to be the lead guitarist. And I'm thinking I better start rehearsing because auditions are coming pretty soon. And just over and over again, this man died like I've never seen anybody. You know, I don't know about you, but I believe Ron's here today. I, and I think he is, he is. He's looking down from heaven, and first of all, he wants to say to you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for what you do every day to go above and beyond, way beyond your job description, to care for these patients like they're part of your family, because if that one dialysis nurse had not made it her mission to find Ron, and track him down, he would have never lived the most amazing last week of his life. So thank you. And Ron also wanted to say, well, this is the picture of the, I actually did get married after his funeral. I know that sounds a little strange, doesn't it? He, he was alive, though. He really was alive. Yes, yes, yes. Hire Kathy Dempsey for your next virtual or in-person event. Her Shed or Your Dead prescription will equip you to adapt faster and succeed.